This is a message to everyone, the mayor, Samaritan Village, and any elected official that, are, that will be in favor of this. Take a look at the community. Take a look at the community. People are here. People are, are here tonight saying no, 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 no. I am a single mother of three children. Okay, I will not feel safe if a show a men's shelter at like that is right here filled with criminal backgrounds. This is not an investment in our neighborhood. You guys have to stand up. No shelter here. No shelter here. No shelter here. Look at the people. There's a lot of people here saying no tonight. I am 92 years old. I am still fighting for my community. My children deserve safety. And I'm afraid anything happened to our children. So if we have to fight, we will fight. We will fight. Opening up shelter after shelter is not the solution. Is not the solution to the homeless crisis. Vulnerable families do not want to live in a shelter and be moved from shelter to shelter every few months. DHS is spending millions of dollars every year to run these shelters. With all this money, we can turn this 200-plus room hotel into affordable housing units. It won't be a transient population anymore, and we will welcome them. They're very concerned about homeless people coming into Elmhurst. Um, and these emails were very, I guess they were very scared and they just, I guess, were saying things like, well, what if we get hurt? And what if it brings down our property value? What if it ruins our neighborhood? And in my head, I'm just thinking, well, you have no idea until you meet them. I, I need to meet people until I, then I know, you know, what's, what's going on. But they just kind of prejudged. I'm originally from Astoria, but I represent Middle Village now. This is my home, and I'm going to continue to fight against new people. I know why you're here at all. You're not welcome in Middle Village and Glendale. They stereotype us like we never had nothing. We didn't come from nothing. We're uneducated. We're jobless. We're bums. We're thieves. We're liars. This is a tug of war now. So. As a society, we want to make sure, and as elected official, I want to make sure that I represent my district and my community, so their sentiments. So if the community, we have to strike a balance between providing shelter to these individuals that are homeless, which by law we have to, and making sure that the community is involved in, in helping that as well. So we need to inform the community in terms of what's going to happen and how long it's going to last, who's going to be there, that type of thing. We can't prevent homeless people from being in the area because they're already living here. Um, we held three protests, one of which we had over a thousand people there protesting that they didn't think this was a good idea. And after that, it was all over the papers that the Asian community was not caring about the homeless people. The homeless residents in the shelter, they are, they can be black, white, Latino, Asian, it does, no, poverty doesn't discriminate. So to say that we are racist against the sh people in the homeless shelter, it does not make sense, but it sells newspapers. And it lets the local politician, Daniel Drum, have an easy way out to just not deal with this problem. No more no more shelter, no more no more shelter, no more no more shelter, no more no more shelter. Every single one of us starts with an assumption that if we could
could just build enough affordable housing that somehow there would be no such thing as shelter. And that's been proven, unfortunately, wrong many times over. We're in the middle of the biggest affordable housing program in the city's history that's going to reach 700,000 people. Uh, and there's still a need for a lot more. So maybe in the past that was a simpler truth, but it's not the truth now. We've got a lot of folks who are going to need shelter, and then we get them to something better. As I said, 130,000 people, it's a huge number of people, came out of shelter and, and got to affordable housing. If they don't feel safe and they want to end up on the streets, I would hate for that to happen. Um, even here, I mean, in Elmhurst, there has been a case where they found someone frozen to death on Broadway Park, and it was really sad. When you, when you hear that, you just wonder why didn't they want to go into a shelter? What was it about the shelter that they didn't want to be there for? Right now, I'm homeless. I'm, I'm living in the shelter. I'm living out of welfare, things that I thought were going to be impossible in my life. Shelters are, um, have many cameras everywhere, so although everything goes through a metal detector, there's, they don't have um, ways to stop things from happening. And then there'll be fights, people getting arrested. There was prostitution a couple of blocks down from where I was staying. Um, it wasn't a nice place. Everything that you hear about the shelter system, the drugs, the rampant drugs, the violence, the extortion, the blackmail from staff, security, uh, DHS police, uh, other clients, it's all true. Um, you know, there is uh, something to be said about uh, that experience where your dignity is um, almost entirely removed and it's only through the simple acts of kindness uh, that you can uh, sort of make sense of the situation. Sometimes there are people who are unfortunately sex predators that end up in hotels. Uh, we just had two. Uh, the first one in recent years we found out about because uh, someone called our office and they said, you know, there's a sex predator lives at, at uh, is in one of the hotels. <clears throat> of course, D we called DHS. DHS denied it up and down. That's, that's not the case. It's not happened. We looked up the name of the sex predator, and because, as you know, every sex predator has to be registered online, the location of where the sex predator lived was the hotel. <laughs> you know, homelessness is a manufactured problem from the top down. When you incentivize the raising of rents to remove people from uh, an apartment and then don't offer, have any offerings of affordable housing throughout, then it just uh, perpetuates the, um, the cycle of homelessness. And um, unfortunately, there is very little, uh, there's very little opportunity to leave homelessness as the vouchers that are given if you're able to fortunately get one. They don't go up to market rate. Landlords don't take them. I don't care about the community's reaction. The community doesn't want to see the homeless. I get that. So anywhere we go in New York City, you can go to statistically the worst neighborhood. You can go to statistically the best neighborhoods. Nobody's going to be in favor of the shelters, right? Um, the community at large is not going to be in favor of this. People don't want to see homelessness. Homelessness is ugly and smelly, and it's not a good thing to, to come in contact with. So people don't want to see that. I understand that. But I'm opposed to shelters that are not beneficial to the people who are supposed to be served. I make the best of it, but it's stressful for me because it's just too crowded in the one room that we have for three people. Um, the kids' age difference kind of make it hard for us to live as human beings. It's like, it's worse than jobs. To take one person off the street, you have to be involved, for real. You can't just give them a place to sleep. Anybody can give anybody a place to sleep. We have to enter into the fullness of the issue. We got to see what has caused their homelessness. Uh, why do they continue to be homeless on the street versus homeless in a shelter? Um, are, is, you know, are there simple fixes for the issue? Can we advocate for some, some services right away that might help, um, for example, families who don't know that, you know, if the parents are married, oftentimes they're not allowed into the shelter together. And so there's a separation of a family. Something as easy as getting them married or a domestic partnership, if that's what they want, um, so that they can get the proper services that they need, you know. 
So I think the only way to do this right, if you're going to do this shit right, you got to enter into people's lives. And you have to um, listen to the story. You have to know the name. You have to understand where they're coming from. I was working at this event and a hand truck struck me in the ankle. I've been tested by many medical departments and they all tell me the same. You cannot work standing. How you want to be when you get 80s? Do you want to be able to walk? Do you want to be in a wheelchair? So that's pretty much my future. There's a very bad problem of housing here, so since I cannot get a job, I have to end up in the shelter system. Yeah, I've been in and out of the street since 2004. <coughs> I even had a job, but the job didn't pay enough, so I didn't get a place to live. Unfortunately, and now I'm a disabled senior. With what I have for Social Security, I can't get a place to live. The seniors are being forced out of their apartments because they can't afford the rent. It's as simple as that. I was living with my partner 14 years, and recently he passed away, and I had no place to go because we were living with his um, Social Security, paying the rent and that. And when he passed away, um, people from the church tried to help me get on my feet and that. My landlord said I could stay with them for seven months without paying rent, but then it got to the point where you couldn't do it no more, so I was left homeless. My story is that I married an abusive man in 1972 and I didn't know that he was abusive. I would not have said, oh, let me go marry an abusive man, but he didn't become abusive until afterward. But as it turned out, the abuse escalated to the point where it was absolutely unbearable. And it was, over the years, it got worse and worse and it got actually a lot worse when I became pregnant and when I had my son. And we separated, we divorced, and it, but it wasn't over because he kept returning to do more and more. And eventually he harmed my son. I snapped and on February 4th, 1982, I killed him. So I wound up in jail. I got a sentence of 25 to life. But because of the politics in New York State, Governor Pataki had come into power during my incarceration and he decided that he wanted to end parole for all violent felons. And by end parole, he meant don't ever let them out. Finally, um, Columbia Law School helped me with some legal work and an Article 78 to file a lawsuit against the injustices of parole. And why was it that after 35 years of no problems in jail and positive programming and even creating programming, wasn't I ready to go? And I was allowed to go back to another board in 2017 where the consideration of my release had to be done in a different way because the judge said they actually had to look at what was going on in my life at the time of my crime. And because of that, I was released. But I didn't have any um, relatives or any family left in New York State. So I ended up in the shelter system. You'd be surprised at how many PhDs are living in a shelter. You'll be surprised at how many people who, who were unfortunate, who got sick, who had a disease that their money was, um, they lost all their money trying to support their illness or their sickness, and they ended up living in shelters. You'd be surprised at how many foreigners who were professors or who were whatever, big names, 
in their country and they come to live in America and they find out that it ain't as great as they planned out to be or if these situations don't turn out the way that they want it to turn out. You'd be really surprised at some of the caliber of the people that are living on the street. He was frozen to death when we found him. So we're waiting for the official uh, cause of death. Sisters and brothers, we welcome you here this evening as we honor the memorial, the memory of our brother and our friend Arik. Many people ask why we chose to do this memorial outside and not inside of the church. And we thought it was important to be out here tonight so that we could also feel the conditions that not only Arik but the other homeless people in our community are feeling. And so we thought it was also fitting to do it in the place where Arik's body was discovered, the place where Arik was often found hanging out, and this was the place that Arik called home. Me daba dolor ver con el frío o el calor anteriormente el frío que se vayan. Yo a veces yo cerraba los gay y yo, bueno muchacho me voy y voy a cogían ahí abajo esa nieve y yo me a veces me quedaba y cómo bueno ok. en una yo le dije vengan lo voy a dejar en el Berman. Pero con unas condiciones, calladito, no problema, no nada, no tocar nada. Cuando él abría siempre venía a calentarme abajo porque no soy pendejo, discúlpame la expresión. Y un día él me dice, Caco, porque usted siempre mira para el cielo a esta hora porque yo no sé dónde me voy a quedar. Lo dejé, así fueron ellos quedándose y yo dejando porque me daba a mí un dolor sacarlo a ellos. Cuando ya yo vi que eran, ya iban como siete o ocho. Hay una regla, hay una norma. Pueden entrar, pero no pueden salir en la noche hasta que yo no venga. Y efectivamente me dejó dormir. Vine del campo a donde, pues aquí, aquí. Y aquí llevo cinco años. 28 años atrás no había muchos judíos. Ellos fueron llegando apoderándose de la comunidad. Organizadamente se han apoderado porque son organizados. Entonces yo ahí yo lo respeto, yo me respeta. Ellos se sienten cómodos que yo lo quite y lo recoja. Y lo tenga acá. Vienen hasta de la 16 avenida. Y vienen acá, Cándido, y yo díganme, que hay alguien que está frente a la casa, o en la esquina, o en la escuela, vienen directamente a donde mí que si yo lo conozco, que lo quite de ahí, para yo no tener problemas. Yo voy, o mando uno a los muchachos, que esas personas se quiten de frente a la casa de ellos, porque no lo conocen, o pues que sean de color. Entonces yo lo mando a quitar de ahí. Yo llegué aquí sin tener nada ni a nadie. Mi familia primero, cuando salí de prisión, todos ellos me dieron la espalda. Aquí llegué con 217 pesos en 16 años. Me puse a escribir y todos se mofaron. Entonces, pues yo me quité de mi familia, porque yo no escribo por escribir, porque alguna palabrita de las que yo escribo te va a dar en el corazón. Por eso nos vamos con las casas de cartón. Buenas noches o buenos días. Yo me llamo Caco y soy hombre, y con alegría. Los que vivimos en las casas de cartón, pero despierto como león. La mente no duele, el corazón piensa y la calle donde me mata el hambre es incomparable. Capítulos vivientes, día a día, solo sin compañía. Solo la noche me arropa en silencio, abatido a aprender a ser un guerrero, josear, inventar, hasta que cayó el sereno. Sendero de sufrimiento donde se rompe el cuero, puñeta. Boricua soy, soy de manatí, así es, porque somos hombres. Pero aprendemos que la vida da duro, pero nos comprendemos. La noche cayó, las estrellas nacieron. Somos un montón que vivimos en las casas de California.
every Saturday we come and we pick up and they give us all their share of products. So it's a good hit for us. We get a lot of good stuff, uh, quality stuff, a lot of fresh produce, which a lot of times the community doesn't have. And then we take that food, we rebag it, we sort it, we make sure everything is good to go. Everybody will get a, some bread, some fresh fruits, some vegetables. Yeah, so we usually, on a, on a given Saturday, we come in contact with at least 50 people, at very least. Um, not all of them are homeless. Um, we also deal with a lot of food insecurity. A lot of people who have a house, but they can't afford to feed themselves or feed their children. So that's one of the things that we do. It's also very important to us because this community is going through a lot of gentrification. And so the rents are going up. People can't afford to, uh, they have to decide whether to pay rent or pay food. So it's one of those kind of things. There's enough abandoned buildings in New York City and in the nation that if we just repaired what's already there, people would have a home. So that right there. And then you can also give them job training and a viable skill set. It's nice to feed them, it's nice to clothe them, and it's nice to house them and, and take care of them. But you should have a goal, in my opinion. And they don't have goals to say, let's get them out and, uh, and, and, and get them, help them get a job. Because without a job, you're sitting around and doing anything. While they're in our program, they go through math, English, computer classes, and also uh, we offer them hard skill certifications, which, which are, are comprised of all the OSHAs, uh, food handling, janitorial, and forklifting. If they do that, we have, we, we have housing for the people uh, where we pay 50% of their rent, and uh, there's a quid pro quo that they come back, uh, they come back and uh, every month and they have to show that they're in a, a college to increase their salary so they can get out of the, the subsidized housing we have in the Bronx. Wow. A lot of people out there today, you know. You know, I'll be honest with y'all. This is the first thing I ever graduated in my whole life. Mm. And I feel very empowered. The church that we got kicked out of, there was a full commercial kitchen there. And we had um, state of the art equipment. We had uh, professional convection ovens. Uh, currently, at our new location, we don't really have a kitchen. Um, and here, we're limited as to what we can do because the kitchen, this is it a regular, com a regular residential refrigerator and a semi commercial oven and range that doesn't really function so well. Um, so that's a big hit for us. If you do the math, we're helping to serve 400 meals a week out of this kitchen. New York streets, New York streets, this is the life, true story. We have good, humble people such as yourself, sir. We have good, humble people, they take care of us. Good people. But I have a question to ask you. Why you care about us? Everyone, they don't give a F about us. Why do you care about us? Father Michael is the best, the best, one of the best person I ever see to take care of the people. Look, just like that. He gives away his life, even uh, over the family. Thank you. Now, Father Michael is going to be a saint. He's going to be a saint on us, on the streets. He's going to be the saint of the streets. I think there's only one way we end homelessness, and that is everybody collectively gets together and say we're going to end it, right? Outside of that, uh, I don't think we're going to end homelessness overall. Uh, everyone has to have the same mindset of we're going to put in our, our little granito arena, right? Our, 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 our little grain of sand and say, we want to end homelessness. I don't think the community can do anything to end homelessness. I mean, that's up to the city to deal with ending homelessness. It's not your problem until a homeless shelter opens up in your neighborhood. Then it becomes your problem, right? Then you say, oh my God, God forbid, what happened? Why are they in my backyard? I don't think it's fair, but you know, it is what it is. And some things you just can't change in life. So I just, you know, 
try to focus on things that I can change. In the future, I would like a big house so I could get um, room to, to sleep and like get a bed so my mom could cook and I could have space and I would like my dog to come and like so my mom could sleep with me and my dog and my teddy bears.